Hello, this is Father Louis Skurdy with Friends of the Word. We thank you for joining us on our weekly homily as Friends of the Word. If you'd like to be on our email list, contact me at fatherlouiskurdy at hotmail.com. Today is the fourth Sunday of Lent. It is, notice I'm wearing pink. I don't have many pink vestments. It's the only one the parish has. It is celebrating Laetate Sunday. As we move closer to Easter, the symbols are more enlightening. Water to last week and today, light from the, the blindness of the, the blind beggar. So we're moving closer to the, the period of rejoicing and light and enlightenment and our baptismal promises of Easter. Thank you for joining us and pass this homily on to your family and friends if you wish. God bless you and keep the word alive and well. The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. As Jesus passed by, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, neither he nor his parents sinned. It is so that the works of God might be made visible through him. We have to do the works of the one who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he said this, he spat on the ground. And he said this, he got saliva and mixed it with the clay and smeared it on the man's eyes and said to him, Go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. So he went and washed and came back able to see. His neighbors and those who had seen him earlier begging said, Isn't this the one who used to sit and beg? Some said yes. Others said no, it just looks like him. He said, I am. So they said to him, How were your eyes opened? He replied, The man called Jesus made clay and anointed my eyes and told me, Go to Siloam and wash. So I went there and washed, and I was able to see. They said to him, Where is he? He said, I don't know. They brought the one once blind. Jesus had made clay and opened his eyes on the Sabbath. So when the Pharisees asked him how he was to see, he said to them, I said, This man is not from God because he does not the Sabbath. How can a sinful man do such signs? And then there was a division among them. And they said to the blind man again, What do you have to say about him? Since he opened your eyes, he said, He is a prophet. Now the Jews did not believe that he had been born blind and gained his sight until they summoned the parents of the one who had gained his sight. And they asked them, Is this your son who you say was born blind? And how does he see now? His parents answered, we don't know, we do know that this is our son, and he was born blind. We do not know how his eyes were opened, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he's of age, he can speak for himself. And his parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone acknowledged him as the Christ, they would be expelled from the synagogue. For this reason, his parents said, he's of age, question him. So a second time they called the man who had been born blind and said to him, Give God the praise. We know that this man is a sinner. He replied, If he's a sinner, I do not know. One thing I do know is that I was born blind and now I see. So they said to him, What did he do to open your eyes? How did he open your eyes? I told you already. You did not hear it repeated and again. Do you want to become one of his disciples as well? They ridiculed him and said, You are that man's disciples. We are disciples of Moses. We know that God spoke to Moses, but we do not know where this one is from. The man answered and said to them, This is what is so amazing, that you do not know where he is from, yet he opened my eyes. 
We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if one is devout and does his will, he will listen to them. It is unheard of that anyone ever open the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not of God, he would not be able to do such a thing. They answered and said to him, You were born totally in sin, and are you now trying to teach us? And they threw him out. Jesus heard that they had thrown him out, and he found him and said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? He said to him, Who is he, sir, that I may believe in him? Jesus said to him, You have seen him. The one speaking to you is he. He said, I do believe, Lord, and he worshipped Jesus. Then Jesus said, I came into the world for judgment, so that those who do not see might see, and those who do not might become blind. Some of the Pharisees who were there heard this, and he said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? And Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would have no sin. But now you are saying we see, so your sins remain. The Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. They taught a Sunday, pink, vestments, the symbol in the scriptures of light. We're moving closer to the celebration of the Paschal Mystery, the celebration of the resurrection. And the readings, as well as the colors, as well as the words, move us slowly toward the fullness of the message of the resurrection, getting us to appreciate it once again. It's not going to happen again. It happened once for all eternity. But as we move closer to we reflect on the full meaning of it, the scripture speaks to us. A little background today. Recently, as you know, I was in Italy, and we visited some of the major basilicas in Italy, and among them Pisa, you know, where the tower is, but you know, everybody goes for the tower, but there are two other beautiful buildings on that same complex, and one is the cathedral, and the other is the baptistry, and the baptistry is, makes this look small. It's huge. And the baptistry in, in Florence as well, and the baptistry of the major basilicas of Rome as well, as well are huge buildings. And not that I, I knew it, but the guide explained to, to, the, to the group the reason for these large buildings and this big font that was in the middle of each of these baptistries is that in the early days of the church, Christians were only baptized on one day, one day a year. And that was the Vigil of Easter. And the baptism started, like, when, when night got dark, the, the baptism started, and people would line up, I mean, hundreds would line up. So you figure, even if this, if our church only baptized once a year, think, well, now they're babies, but think all the babies we'd have, it'd be a madhouse. But anyway, all of these Christians would line up in the dark of, of night and slowly enter the baptistry where they would be baptized by the local bishop. And they would, of course, enter the water. They would be given a candle, a symbol of light. They would be given new, new clothing as a symbol of their new life together. So when we hear this reading from the Ephesians, put yourself back there in the early centuries of the church, listening to the homily. Basically, some of this is a homily from a Baptist, baptism rite. It's darkness outside, and the only time they move into the church is after the baptism, and they have lights, as, you, as we do at the Easter Vigil. We all have a little candle, and we move into the building of the church, and it gets brighter and brighter until the Alleluia is sung. So imagine being back there, and you hear this from those who are preaching to the Baptist people. Once you were in darkness, but now you are children of the Lord. They've been baptized. Live as children of the light. And then he, he specifies what that means. Producing goodness in every kind of righteousness. Learn what is pleasing to the, to the Lord. And do things that can be exposed to the light. Because it's shameful that we sin. And, and when we sin and we do things that are shameful, we're in the darkness. So as, as the dawn, and you can just see the dawn coming up 
and, and the full body of the community is there in the church celebrating Easter morning. Awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead. Christ will give you light. The, the inspiration of the scriptures in the proper context is just so much more powerful. And that's the message that we have today. But, but we don't have it only on Easter Vigil. We have it today in the scriptures. And we have it every time we gather. Every time we gather, we're being challenged to wake up and live in the light. Well, you saw the, you heard the scriptures. They're very, it's a long selection from John. And it's, again, a play on words, very much like the, the Samaritan woman and misunderstandings and all that going back and forth. And John is presenting Jesus as the light of the world, confirming his role to give us insight, to give us vision. So the man born blind, is healed. And, and, and don't forget John, the evangelist of this particular book of the Gospels, probably Jewish, converted to Christ. So he wants to put the Jewish customs in perspective. And, and he makes it very clear, you know, pro- part of the problem that they had with Jesus was that he was doing things almost disregarding the laws, the many, many, many laws that the Jews had. And one of those laws was don't do any work on, on Sunday, excuse me, the Sabbath. And what did Jesus do? See, Jesus is the new law. So he knew what he was doing. He wasn't making a mistake here. When he sees the man born blind, he, he teaches us. And, and his disciples, naive, like you and me, would be, gee, Jesus, this guy's born blind, you know, like, that person's uh, on, uh, on, on the dole, and that play, person's unemployed, or that person's, uh, you know, uh, handicapped. Or the, and, and we tend to judge. And so I ask him, now, is he born blind because his parents sinned or because he sinned? He's just naive. Remember years ago when AIDS first came on the scene, how many cuckoo evangelists preached that that was a, a curse from God? Well, you can do that, you go right down the line, and, and cancer, and, and miscarriage, and, and colds, and oh, punishments from God. Baloney. And Jesus says about this man, neither he nor his parents are born blind, but he's born blind to give God glory. So that through the action that you're going to see in a few seconds, in parentheses, you're going to see the work of God. You're going to see the light of the world in action. And he mixes the mud and spreads it on the guy's eyes and he sends him to the pool, Siloam, which means scent. So this blind man becomes like the Samaritan woman. Remember her? Another disciple. Another evangelist. Not immediately, but you see his role unravel and he becomes an evangelist. You know, you want to say, like, what's, what's our sight? What's our vision? What, how, how, how much 2020 vision do we have? And how, how many times do we just miss the opportunity to bring what light represents, justice, righteousness, goodness, into the world, into our families, into our lives? And, and, and we back up and we go into our own selfish behaviors so, so often. We back up and we go into me, 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 my, 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 my. And we forget that we're following the Christ, the light of the world, who doesn't shield us from light, but enlightens us and asks us to go and share that light of goodness and justice with other people. In our families, of course, but in the world at large as well. And sometimes, you know, I don't want to do it. I don't want to do it because I'm judging. You know, I'm, well, they're poor, or he's an addict because he's lazy. She's a drunk because she's uh, lazy. This one's this because, oh, yeah? And Jesus, Jesus defies. He doesn't look like anything they want to obey or worship. And he goes back to his roots. David, the founding of the family tree of Jesse, David, King David, that heritage, the story today in the book of Samuel, tells us how God doesn't judge by appearances, but he reads our hearts. So Samuel has been commissioned by God to go ordain, anoint, pour oil on and anoint, separate him from the, from the group by special mandate, someone in Jesse's household. But there is a king already. The king is Saul. And a few years before this, Samuel anointed Saul. But Saul told God where to go. 
Saul decided to run it his way, without God. Saul, as a matter of fact, hired even David to comfort him. He was depressed. Probably manic depressive, we don't know, but he, they suffered melancholia. They hired David to play the harp, to soothe him. Oh, nice. Oh, that, that calms him down, you know? Music therapy, way back when, the Bible. That's where the Psalms come from, from attributed to David and his, his, his plain music for this king and another, other occasions. But what happens when he becomes famous and popular, David, you know, David of Goliath, remember he killed Goliath? He becomes popular. Saul, hmm, gives him a look. Yeah. He gets jealous. And through this jealousy, he's penalized for his success. He's penalized for being talented, for being good, for being pure-hearted. He's penalized, and Saul eventually wants to kill him. So this is this the background of this, this David. So David's out. He's, a, he's a, taking care of a sheep. He's a shepherd. So Jesse brings up his sons and says, these are my sons, one better looking than the other, one more talented than the other, one brighter than the other. They're, and he says to, to Sam, God, choose one. It doesn't come to Samuel, the inspiration. So he says, you have another one? Ah, that's, that's David out in the countryside. He's taking care of this. He's taking care of the crops. He's taking care of the sheep. Get on with the celebration. Anoint one of these. No. Bring that one in. And that one comes in. The unlikely one. The one who didn't seem to be as popular or as well-bred as the other seven brothers. And that's the one God tells him, anoint this one. He's the one. The unlikely one. Because God doesn't judge on just what he looks like. God reads his heart, and he knew David well enough to make him eventually the great king that he becomes, the ancestor of Jesus, your God and my God. This was his biological ancestor in antiquity. That happens, I remember once, I was about this day, I was a little altar boy, and on Saturdays, we used to, I guess it wasn't punishment, but it seemed like punishment, we used to observe, prior to being an altar boy, observe Mass. Okay, you, you dressed up in the outfit and you sat alongside in, on kneelers and you watched, but you observed, I was an observer, we watched the altar boy serve mass and I'm dating myself but it was in Latin those days so you had to observe and practice the language and all that good stuff. But the masses were men's and orta. They were in the middle of the night I thought, you know, 6.30 in the morning. Okay, so I went, if I wanted to be an altar boy, let's go. So I go there and I'm dressing up before mass and Father Michael Arcangelo, that was his name. His mother had great plans for him, right? Michael Arcangelo, he was an Italian priest from the parish, and he spoke with a little bit of an accent, and he said, uh, where's the altar boy? I said, I don't know, you know, the observers wore red, the altar boys wore black. I said, well, he's not here yet, Father. And now I'm getting nervous, because who am I going to observe? You know? He says, well, it's a, it's a time, it's a 6.30, you serve. I said, oh, no, 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 Father, no, no. I, I forget. He has a, it's a language barrier. I said, no, I'm an observer, not a server. Yeah, you serve. I said, no, 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 Father. And we got this dialogue. I felt like a comedy act going on. And I'm getting nodded because I was, oh, no, no. He, he's looking at me like another one. And I'm looking at me like I'm not qualified. No, no, I can't do the Latin. I can't do the signs. And there, there were so many things to do. You got it easy now, kid. But those days, there was a lot to do. Okay. He said, no, you serve. Put in the black clothes and you serve. And I served. I guess I did all right. I'm an altar boy then. Guess what now? So I guess I did all right. Now, I'm not saying there was no divine, there was divine intervention there, but, but that happens in our lives. When we're misinterpreted and God is asking us to stand up for what we believe and stand up for what is good and, and, and accept the challenge face, facing us, whether it's a challenge of forgiveness, whether it's a challenge of love, whether it's a challenge of charity, asking us to stand up. I know it doesn't feel right. I know you, you don't, you, you'd rather judge and not be there. But if God is calling and if it imitates goodness, righteousness, and judgment that is positive, be there. And so David was anointed. And Jesus, centuries later, is being judged again because he decides to do goodness and charity. Don't forget, he is the law. The Jews didn't regard him as the law, but he is the law. 
He's the new law. He's, he, he, he's role coming into the world to bring the light of God to the world. So where, where judgment can be negated and prejudice can be put aside and injustice can be fought. And, and this goes on even to today. And Jesus is making it very clear with his disciples and with his actions that this man is being anointed, not with oil, olive oil that used to be blessed and used just for sacred anointings, like you and I were anointed at baptism and you and I were anointed at confirmation and the altar was anointed at, when it was first consecrated, set aside to do something good like you and I are supposed to be, set aside to do good. He was anointed with mud. But the spit of Jesus, my own, you couldn't ask for better than that. And with that mud, that ironic behavior of smearing mud on a guy's eyes, we have another step toward our enlightenment. How God wants us to see through the mud of civilization, see through the mud that gets in our eyes from, from prejudice and greed and hate, see through that. And who we see is like the, what the blind man saw. Who is he? I, I, yeah, I, I want to believe in the Son of Man. Who, show me who he is. You're looking at him. You're looking at him. Then I do believe him. I believe in him. And what did he do? He got down on his hands and knees and he worshipped Jesus. We should do any less. He comes to us every day in, in, in the, the unlikely form of bread and wine. Yeah, we say amen. We go back to our seats. But we are being enlightened. We are being confronted and meeting Jesus Christ, the Son of God, light of the world, in those moments of Eucharist, so that we leave here and look at the poor and look at the handicapped and look at the disabled and look at the marginalized in our society through the eyes of love, through the eyes of enlightenment. The blind man started propagating the faith, talking about Jesus, even to the Pharisees. You want to believe in him? You want to be his follower? And he was happy about that, and he shared that. But he was not rewarded. Mark that. He did God's will, but was not rewarded by civilization. He did God's will, and he was isolated from the community. He was thrown out of the synagogue. Do God's will. You're not going to be rewarded here on earth. The light of the world came and brought us God the Father's light and he was not rewarded. He was crowned with thorns and nailed to the cross. And that became his throne. So don't go for accolades. Don't go for a pat on the back because you're doing what is right. You're forgiving. You're, you're, you're watching your, your behaviors during Lent. You're abstaining. You're, you're staying away from temptation. D don't, don't give yourself any accolades for that. It should bother us. We should be aggravated. I, I'm not a role model, but yesterday was a we, we call it a skirty festival. My South Jersey cousins get together once a year and they have a big skirty festival. It's, it's insane. It's all skirties. Imagine like 40 of me in one room. Everybody talks at the same time. Everybody has jokes. Everybody... So I walk in and Johnny says, Here, Luigi, here's this glass of wine. I says, No, I don't drink wine. I don't drink liquor during, during Lent. It's no big deal. You know, it's my particular choice. I don't... You don't drink? I... Not that I'm an alcoholic that I know of, but... I said, no, it's Lent. I said, he's, I said well, so joking. I said, so why'd you have a party during Lent? You know, it's, wow, well, yeah. Okay, take those little things that you give up. The negative behavior, the negative words, the, the, if you stay away from a particular food, you stay away from a particular drink, stay away from a particular behavior, stay away from a particular drug. Take those as challenges that bother you, but give glory to God. And isolate you. I wasn't isolated by the scurdy bleeding. They, 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 they love me more than ever. But not isolated from society is where we should be. Because we are anointed, set apart to do God's will. And we're, we're going to be a minority. Okay. Jesus was one. 
His disciples were 12. The blind man was one. Minorities. All rejected by society. All rejected by the establishment. Because of their righteousness and their goodness and doing God's will. So what do we do? We unite ourselves to God. We come closer to him during this season of Lent. So to, to imbibe the waters of salvation, to take the illumination of the light of our faith, to take it all inside and, and join one another at the Easter vigil or Easter morning in saying, Alleluia, he is risen. He's with me. And he gives me strength each day. Not to stand out in the crowd, not to be a show-off, but be the Christian. As unlikely a person as I might be, as a role model any of us might be, he's choosing us to do his will. I don't care if you're in a wheelchair, I don't care if you're a newborn in a carriage, I don't care what your job is, I don't care what your background is, he's choosing every one of us as we hear his word to do his will and bring his light into the world. So at the Easter vigil or Easter morning, hallelujah means something to us. It means that we've destroyed at least another level of inclination toward the darkness of life and brought peace and brought light and brought forgiveness to one person or the community in which we live.